good to see you all here today, and I uh, hope it's super rainy the Lord's Day, but it's the Lord's Day, amen, and we come to, to, to celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our call to worship this morning, if you want to turn in your hymnal, it's number 552 on Jordan's Stormy Banks, I Stand, and let's sing it together.
And so also with that, if y'all will all stand, we're going to open up the service in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this day and for everything that you have given. Lord, I thank you for all who are here, Lord, and, and the hearts and the words that, uh, that you've given to preach this morning. Lord God, I pray right now that you will be a part of this church and that this worship time will be glorious upon to your, in your ears. Lord, I pray that this worship will be a sweet aroma to you, Lord. Lord God, I pray that we will just open up our hearts and our souls and our minds and leave everything behind and just lift up our voices and our hearts to you. Lord, I pray right now that the Spirit will flow in between us, Lord, and be in here amongst us, God, and just move us, Lord, that we will worship and serve you in all that we've give, you've been given. Lord, I pray that you will anoint this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing. <clears throat> We continue our worship this morning. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. We're going to sing, Thou Art Worthy. It's on page 73 in your hymn. Mm -hmm.
darkness would have never seen the light would have known for the sunrise if it wasn't for the night if there hadn't been a father who made a way where there was none i'd still be in oakland if it wasn't for his son if there hadn't been a grave Thing you know, they're everywhere and they make a mess. And now you're in big. 
get in trouble, right? Because you made a mess everywhere because he lied all the time, right? So God wants you to be truthful. He wants you to tell the truth. And when you tell the truth, what? You don't have to worry about all the little lies that we make, right? You don't have to worry about the mess that little lies make, right? So God wants you to be a truthful person and always tell the truth, even if you've done something wrong. So I can tell you as a mama or a daddy that when my kids lied to me and they did something wrong, it made the punishment worse. Okay? They would rather you tell them the truth than to lie about something, okay? All right? We're not going to get up here because we always tackle each other, so we're just going to bow our heads and pray real quick. Okay? We're not going to play poker, guys. That's not good either. <laughs> all right, let's pray. Lord, again, I thank you for all the ones who were up here this morning. Lord, I pray for their hearts that would come to know you. Lord, I pray for their little hearts to be true, and Lord, that their lips would be pure. Lord, I thank you for all that you have given. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Get all my cards back there. Thank you. <laughs> If you'll open up your Bibles, we'll be looking again at Hosea. We're getting close to the end here. Uh, I'll, I'll do a special message for our mothers next week, and then we'll close Hosea the week after that. Um, and so we're getting here towards the end. And um, as we said, as we've been coming in and coming through everything, when we get here, I want to give you a little bit of history that when the Israelites came across the Jordan into the Promised Land, when uh, they were moved in over here with Joshua, there were two tribes, Gad and Reuben, and they asked if they could have their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan. Well, that was good. Moses added that they could have that land, but they had first had to cross the Jordan, and this is all you know, put in numbers. But I'll say that you will, you can have it, but you had first got to come and fight with us. And if you don't come and fight with us, it tells us, he gives us the scripture in Numbers, and I'll, I'll go more over that here at the end. But it says, and if you don't do this, you will have sinned against the Lord, and eventually your sin will find you out. And that is the key to what Hosea says here this morning on our scripture, that our, your sin is going to find you out. And actually, here in our scripture, the sin actually did find them out. And we're getting to the point here, as I told you, many times when we read the Bible, we always think it is like happening right here and right here. But it's actually years and even decades have passed. And you had a prophet, Hosea, who has been preaching the entire time to tell them to repent, which also shows the patience God will have with each and every one of us wanting us to repent of that sin or that idolatry, whatever we put in front of God, that sin, that idol that we have. God has patience. He is a patient God. But he is a just God. We talked about that in a couple of other verses earlier. But here we have, we've come to the point, coming to the end of Hosea. And, you know, I've told you all along from day one, that ruler of Assyria, the tiglath pileser III, that he is now attacking. And we come to know that at this point in time, he has already attacked uh, Samaria. So he is already coming in. And so this is Hosea's last warning. It's the last warning that the judgment has come upon you. But at this point in time, you need to repent. And he's coming to them, telling them that your sin has finally caught up to you. And we even have a hint here that King Hosea is actually one of the most ungodly kings that they'd ever had. And he was the one that tried to, to you know, politicize his way to get his little groups around him rather than trusting God. And doing away with the sinfulness that Hosea had been preaching about. And trying to trust God and protect them and rallying themselves around God, who had always been there for them, which we'll see here in our passage today. Well, we even see that in verse 10, that we'll see later, you know, Hosea even asked you, where's your king now? He seems to be missing. The king seems to be gone. So at this point, either Hosea has been killed or he's been captured. But we have this that it is coming to full fruition right here, what Hosea and God had warned not just yesterday, today, that he had been giving up to them for over a period of time saying, hey, your sins are finally going to catch up to you. 
And we like to try to hide it. We try to like to cover it up. But he said, you know, we tell everybody that sin will find you out. And it has always been a way that chooses to mess your life up. Kind of like the little cards. You know, oh, well, I can do this and it's just one or it's just two. But then you start covering and eventually it's a mess. You, you completely have gone everywhere. And now you don't know what to do. And, it, and everybody thinks that my little sin is only going to hurt me. It's my little pet. It's okay for me until it gets out and it starts biting the neighbors and your family and everybody else. You know? It's like we try to hide it and it's okay. It's okay as long as we, we keep it in our little confinement. We can control this sin in our lives. But it never works that way because it always eventually grows to the point that that sin, that idol, that thing that you have in your life will eventually overtake your life because that's all you want it to be. And so we look at our scripture, we'll break it down a little bit a uh, verse at a time. And so the first point I have this morning is, is Hosea preaching out there that sinful choices lead to consequences. Sinful choices lead to consequences. Look at me, we're going to look at one through three. And it says this. When Ephraim spoke, and we learned last week who Ephraim was. We'll stop real quick there. When Ephraim spoke, Ephraim was what y'all learned was the political realm of the kingdom. Our Washington, D.C. They were the leaders that were up there. They kind of spoke for Israel. Wherever Ephraim was kind of leading, they, they did. They were the, the popularity thing. They were the trendsetters. They held over the economics. They did everything, right? Kind of what we have now. And so when Ephraim was misleading the country, and they had the preachers preaching not the truth in the pulpit, and they had all this thing going for them because nobody wanted to hear what God had to say because they had, well, God's talking about my sin. I don't want to hear that. He's stepping on my toes. I just want to hear about how everything is good and lovely and pure and, and all the sunshines and rainbows and unicorns that are out there and that everywhere we walk that everything is good and that everything is fine. And Ephraim, that's all people want to hear is things that tickles the ears. They don't want to hear that you have this sin that goes against what God preaches and God teaches. And so, Ephraim, what Hosea is saying, he said, at one point in time, when Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He exalted himself in Israel. But through Baal, he incurred guilt and died. And now they sin more and more. And they make for themselves cast metal images, idols, skillfully made from their silver. All of them work of craftsmen and they say to them let the people sacrifice kiss the calves therefore they will be like the morning cloud and then like the dew which soon disappears like chaff which is blown away from the threshold and they like smoke from a chimney so what a great nation Israel was when God had got them I told you at the beginning of Hosea that Israel was flourishing they had money. They had everything. They had prestige. Nobody wanted to go to battle with them. They, when he says, when they spoke, what? There was trembling in the, in, the, in the rest of the world. Nobody wanted to deal with Israel. Nobody wanted to deal with that kingdom. They left them alone. They had had peace for a long time. And they were expounding. And they were getting rich. But then they started relying on their own, on their own realm and their own ways. And like he said last week, they said, look at us and what we have done. We have done all these things. Not God. They kicked God out. Sounds familiar to me. Sounds familiar in the way that I live today. Even in our own national government that we have. They have set themselves up. They don't even listen to the people. You know, even with what we went through in 2020 with the vote, even if everything is good and it's fine, but you had half of your country saying they wanted one thing and half the other. And so, but now we have a whole government that just completely disses what one half says. And they say, no, nope, you're going to be living this way. And if you don't go by what we say, you are a bigot, you are a hypocrite, we're going to silence you, we're not going to let you tell the truth, we're going to do what? 
What everything Hosea and God has warning that you have taken the truth of God and exchanged it for depravity. It's everything at Easter Sunday that I showed in Romans. It said you have taken the truth that God has given and you have cast it in for the creation that I created. And they're doing it here. He said you had a voice and was trembling. Everybody listened to you. Everybody was, was trembled at what you had when I was your God. But now, because you have exalted yourself, in verse 1, he said, but through Baal, meaning your idols, you did wrong, and now you die. Folks, when we take God out of our country, we take God out of our life, and we take that sin enter into our life, it is going to wreak havoc. It is going to undermine you. It is going to shake you. I've used this illustration before. It's one of my favorite illustrations. I get it from one of the guys I love, Tony Evans. He talked about his house having cracks in the wall. And I've shared it with you before. You're just going to bear with me because I hope you just remember how this worked. But he said he looked up and he saw these cracks coming up and in the ceiling of his wall. So he hired a painter. He said, look, I've got cracks going up and down my wall. So the painter came in and he sanded everything down and he put stuff over the cracks. And he repainted the whole room, right? And it looked brand new and shiny and everything was great. Okay. He said, but then a couple of months later, he started seeing the cracks started coming back. He said, the cracks then brought their cousins and their aunts and their uncles. And all of a sudden, he had a whole big spider web of cracks all over the wall. So he gets the painter back and says, hey, man, I thought you fixed it. So the guy did the same thing. He patched all the cracks. He painted over the walls. He did everything. It looked nice and pretty. He said, sure enough, a few months later, what? The cracks came back. They thought, well, I ain't using this guy again. He don't know how to fix it. So he brought in another painter. Painter comes in, says, hey, I need you to fix my cracks. And he said, buddy, I can't fix your cracks. I said, why? He said, because your foundation's off. When your foundation is wrong and flawed, you will start to have your entire house shift. Right. You will start to have problems in there. And that is what Hosea warned. He warned that your sin is going to have consequences. Your actions have consequences. Your idolatry has consequences. And when you have no life, <laughs> there's no life without God. There is only death. So these idols that they or bring it out. They told them that you were to come out and you're to kiss the idol. You're to give it. They turned over their lust and their desires to what God had created. Baal was what? A fertility god. So they started worshiping the creation of what? God's life. God said he had instituted what marriage was supposed to be. That two people love each other. They love each other. And I use this all the time. The phrase that we're, we're making love, right? And we have all these hip-hop songs all about it, right? But they don't understand what the concept is. When you True making love. And true love is, is when two people who have committed their lives together before God because they love each other have the institution that God had created that, that what? They can love each other intimately and physically. And in doing so, the two of them create love, which is the third one that they bring into the world. So the two of them love each other, and now they have a child together that they now love. So love has multiplied. And that child will end up loving them, and they love them. But why? Because it all happened in the right way, in the right institution. And yet, we have, even as this week, one of our states of union that have got a law saying it's okay to kill a child 28 days after birth. We have exchanged the knowledge of the truth of God for a lie. A lie. And we do it on, it doesn't happen all at once. It happens when individuals' hearts have become corroded and have gone the wrong direction. These idols that we are kissing, we may not have the image of a calf or the image of some metal thing in front of us. Ours is pretty much this right here today. Me. I am my idol. 
It's what's best for me. I will worship me. I will adore me. I will give whatever makes me feel good. Whatever doesn't offend me, I will accept. It's me rather than he, God himself. So, let me ask you, as Peter did, at the end, if you are shallow and you, this is what you are adoring and you are calling what evil that you have and you're not giving over to God, what will be shown of eternal value in your life when you face God? And that's exactly what's happening here. One day, absent from this body, we will be in the presence of God. Amen. And one day, God says in his word that everything that you've done will be tested by the refiner's fire. And there will be some of us that get in by the skin of our teeth. We get in, but it's not glory. We are to spread the message of God. We are to give our hearts to God. We are to do everything we have in his honor and his glory. Our marriages, how we raise our children, how we do our work, what our work ethic is, how we care, carry ourselves. Are we reliable? Are we dependable? Are we true men and women of God? Do, does our word mean anything to anybody? Or is it just a batch? That is what a Christian is supposed to be. It's supposed to be all those things. Why? Because we want to represent our Father. So he hints us in the first three chapters, reminding us that you have not repented and you have gone and ordained yourself. Like he said, you were once this, but now because you've exalted yourself and now you start worshiping your own sin and your own God and you will now die. So he goes in after he explains that to them. He then reminds them, God speaks to remind you that you have put your faith in yourself. You've exalted yourself. You've exalted your idol. You've exalted your sin. But let me tell you and remind you about me. So in the next couple of verses, number two, that God is all powerful and he reminds them. He reminds them. So let's look at verses four through eight. He says, yet I have been the Lord your God. Since the land of Egypt, and you were you were not to know any God except me. Remember, he gave them the commandments. Michael preached on them Wednesday night. You should have no other God before me, right? I am your God. I'm your God. And here's a key phrase here. I love this. For there is no Savior beside me. There is no Savior beside me. And it's just as, as Debbie sang this morning, a beautiful song, perfect, thank you, you and Cheyenne both. What it said, if, I, if there was no grave, I would not be saved, right? It's not exactly the words, but that's, but that's the, the gist of it. If there had not been a Savior, only God can save, only God can do it, and God has said it all the way back in Hosea's time. He said, I have been with you forever. There is no Savior beside me. He goes on, he says, I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. And as they had their pasture, they became satisfied. And as they became satisfied, their heart became proud. <clears throat> Therefore, what? They forgot me. So I will be like a lion to them, like a leopard. I will lie in wait, and I will confront them like a bear deprived of her cubs. And I will tear open their chest, and I will devour them like a lioness, as an animal that would tear them too. They were relying on what he's saying is this, I was your God, I am your Savior, I was there with you through your wilderness, through your rough times, I was with you. However, you've exalted yourself. you decided to what? Rely on your own gods. you started to rely on yourself. you started to rely on your sin will get you through it, right? Well, guess what? Because of that, your heart is now proud. So guess what? While I am a God of mercy and compassion, I am also a God of a lion. I am also a God that's a leopard, and I am also a God of a bear. I cannot tolerate sin in front of me. So I will allow you to be torn apart by your sin, if that's what you're going to rely on. If you want that sin, you want that idol in your life, if you want whatever it is, if you want to rely on your money, if you want to rely on your reputation, you want to rely on all that, that that's going to get you through things, then I'm going to give it to you. Here it is. But be made known, as I've said before, that which you put your trust in, that, if it's not, if that's your foundation that you're going to put it on, 
He said, I will allow it to happen. And guess what? You will be torn to shreds. Because you have no foundation. He said, once again, they're reminded that the power of God to bring them out of Egypt, providing for them for 40 years. And he provided for all their needs. And what happened? They got proud. They became arrogant. They forgot God in the wilderness. And he says, you know what happens when you forget God? You become self-pride and arrogance. And the Israelites felt like they were self-sufficient, self-made, and self-secure. Everything America feels today. We are, we, are, we are so proud of everything, but yet we are tearing each other apart. And we're fashioning for ourselves idols. To forget God is not to know God. And if you, if you don't know God, you no longer live in a relationship with God. You can no longer be with God. And they left their only source of life. And they put it all in the hands of their idols. And the other imagery here that he pictures, you know, I, I'll tell you, I love Hebrew. It is an imagery born language back to the old Hebrew. And they paint a picture. And the picture that Hosea is painting here from God is that Hosea warns the people of Israel that the judgment of God is coming on them because of their sin. And that the lion, the leopard, and the bear were very ferocious animals. Okay, we, we've established that. And that's the sin. And these animals will attack sheep, in particularly that have no shepherd. Okay? So if they had no shepherd to protect them, they would come in and they would swiftly kill them and annihilate them. They were ferocious animals. They were indiscriminate. They didn't care. The people of Israel are being projected that they are sheep now without a shepherd because they've forgotten him. They've wandered off into another pasture where the sheep is. They have strayed away from him, and therefore the shepherd can no longer provide protection for them because they no longer want to be in the field where he had them before. So since they've strayed away, they have opened themselves up to the lion, the leopard, and the bear. So friends, in all humility, what I can tell you this morning is this. If you have placed yourself in such a grave danger by allowing a sin in your life if you have something in your life a temptation that you continue to coddle and continue to invite in you are a sheep wandering in an unfamiliar pasture and that's the end if you're going to keep this lie in your life if you're going to keep this sin in your closet. If you're going to try to hold this little idol or whatever it is that you put in front of God with you, you have wandered from the sheepfold and out of in your and the further you get away and the further you get absorbed into this sin and the further you try to keep it hidden and the more that you feed it, the bigger it gets, the further away you get from the shepherd's voice. It's loud at first. Right? When I was growing up, my mama told me, you know, growing up right over here, right over on Emerald Lake, I was allowed to go as far away from the home as I could hear. And I mean, you can tell, and the closer you are, mom says, hey, Ryan, time to come in, I can hear. I mean, you start to learn your boundaries how far until you can't hear the voice. And sometimes it gets harder and harder to hear. And that's what he's saying. And if you allow this sin in your life and you can't hear God's voice and you don't want to hear it and you want to drown it further and further away so that it becomes only a whisper or a nudge. And then you get so far away that you don't even want to know the truth anymore. You don't want to accept it because you start lying to yourself. Many of us think we can see the dangers in our life and think that we are spiritually aware. But let me say to you, if you you try to justify the sin in your life, you are completely spiritually blind. And God warns us that Satan is a roaring lion crying around to devour you. He wants to destroy families. He wants to put that whisper. He wants to put that laziness. He wants to put that whatever it is. That little nagging, well, I don't like the music that was playing. I don't like the color of the carpet. I don't like the preacher. I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm not going today because of this. Those are whispers. Those are whispers. 
a devil keeping you from God. You worked really hard last night. You, 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 you worked real hard last night. You can't go in. Folks, when y'all brought me here and, and I said Terry would always worry about me when I was working the 12 hour night shift and I'd come in and I'd be tired. Sometimes I, I didn't even get a break. I was up and I literally rolled in, took a shower, put my clothes on because we had something tragic happen. So I did not get off at duty at four o'clock in the morning. I literally was walking in the door at eight o'clock, taking a shower and getting my Bible and having everything ready to come in here and preach. Y'all probably saw it for several couple of days. But the reason I'm here is not because I was your pastor. The reason I'm here is because I needed to be here. Amen. I needed to be with y'all. I needed to be with worshipers and encouragers. I needed that because I saw the wrecks of devil all throughout my career. I see lives that are not being, and who have drifted away from God or never knew God and don't want to hear God's voice. And I want to be amongst people that are willing to listen to the word of God. And folks, that is why you come to church to worship, to let it out, to let God know, to have people here who do love you, will hug you, and will do anything if they can to help you. You need food. I know a lot of people in here will give you food. Y'all have had a heart to pay people's bills. You've helped by washer. You've done everything that is needed to be done. You're so generous. Why? Because you love God. And God wants to do that and to share that. And that is why we are here to be closer to him and not listen to the whisper of the devil. So that leads me to point three this morning, which is to trust God as your king of your life. So God shows them that of his power. He reminds them that I am your savior. There is no one that can save you but me. So he goes on in verses 9 through 13. There's a lot here. It says, it is your own destruction, Israel, that you are against me and against your help. Where then is your king that he might save you in all your cities and your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes? I, I mean, God gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. And the guilt of Ephraim is wrapped up. His sin is stored up. Again, this is where the sin has found him out. The pains of childbirth are coming. He is not a wise son, for it is not the time that he should delay the opening of the womb. So, so God said, if y'all know the history, God was leading the people. He's for the people. He gets them all settled. They get in their land. And they look around and, well, you know, the Joneses have a king. And the Smiths have a king. We want a king. God says, you don't need a king. You have the king of kings. You have the Lord of lords. You have the God. I have protected you. You don't need one, but we need a king. We want a king like everybody else. We don't need God. We, we need a king. So God gave them a choice to give them a king. And who they picked? They picked the biggest and the tallest. They didn't pick the most spiritual. They picked the one who said he was head and shoulders above everybody else was a Saul. Imagine that it was all the great height that we believe about five foot six. Head and shoulders, everybody else. That's my man going to lead our kingdom, right? And eventually Saul did wrong against God and sinned and, and became away from him, got too wrapped up. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, where's your king? Hosea is now missing. Hosea may be dead. That he may save you. You should be trusting me. He's reminding me, if you trust me, I was there for you. But I gave you what you wanted. And even though it wasn't what you needed, I gave it to you. In verse 9, God describes himself as a helper that they rejected. Three times in the Old Testament, God describes himself as a, help, a helper. <clears throat> he does it in Psalms, where he says that he is a helper to the fatherless. He also describes himself in Psalm as the helper of those that deserve punishment, but don't get it. He delivers them. And he calls him a helper of those who are being pursued by their enemies. Israel is fatherless, they're deserving punishment, and the Assyrians are at the gates of Samaria. And he's asking them, who do you turn for help? He said, you need to be turning to the helper, the one who's always been there, but you don't. So he says, where is your king? Where is your one that's going to save you? God says, 
you continue to reject me, forget me, and so therefore your sins will find you out. They could have had life as we've gone through all of Hosea and getting here to the end. I don't know how many times that I preached and God begged and pleaded with them for, for repentance. He begged and pleaded them to turn away from their ways, to make it all out in the open, to set it down at the altar and repent and turn away from it and turn back to him. He asked them all through it and now they have a problem. And they would not seek the life that came from the one who gives it to them. But they are going to remain in darkness. He tells them, friends, this morning, that if you think you're wise or foolish and you don't have God in your life, you, are, you, you think that you're wise, but you're really foolish if you don't think you need God in your life and you don't think that you have a sin and you don't think that you, know, you really need him. But God says, you know, even in, even in the midst of all this, as he always has done, he's telling them, the sin is at the gate, that your judgment is coming. He gets to verse 14, which is quoted later in Corinthians. But he says this in verse 14. He says, shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? Death, where are your thorns? Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion will be hidden from my sight. And these seem like a rough thing, but they're actually wonderful that they are what's used to show God's love and mercy when he tells them, when he does redeem them, when he does finish it, and he puts it on the cross, and he rises from the grave, that these sentences here, that death no longer has a hold on us, the thorns and the sting of death have no victory over us, because Jesus Christ, him, the God himself, who is the only one who can save, has done it. It is finished. God does not exhort, ignore their sin, nor does it go unpunished, but he sent someone to ransom and pay for that sin and deliver it to his feet at the altar. Jesus Christ did it so that we can be redeemed. God will ransom and redeem them, though they are going to have to deal with the punishment of their sin. And we get on down to verses 15 and 16. We'll wrap it up here. That he tells them that their prosperity is going to end their punishment is coming because they re, they become so proud. And their prosperity will disappear. And just as the fruit of the orchard is destroyed by the east wind and the wellsprings, as it says in verse 15, he goes through the flourishes among the reeds, and the east wind will come, and the wind of the Lord is coming from the wilderness. And the fountain will become dry, and the spring will be dried up, and will plunder the treasury of every precious article. He says, your prosperity is coming to an end because of your sin. Folks, that goes to us today. We can sit here as Christians and as people, and we can try to hide that and not want to give it to God and not want to embarrass ourselves, and that's what repentance is about, is humbling yourself before God even if that means you're going to be embarrassed about it. Because the embarrassment is not worth the destruction that the sin will create and havoc in your life. It's not. That's why God says, he who humbles himself, I will lift him up. It is a beautiful picture of us coming and kneeling down before God and asking God to forgive me of my sin that I have done wrong. And that I have this that I put before you. And God says, my child, you can stand. You are forgiven. We'll leave that there on the floor. And God has asked every one of us. And he says patiently over and over again. He's calling. He's knocking out the door. But if you refuse to repent and your heart remains stubborn and you remain full of pride, God warns, there will be a sin that finds you out. It's going to find you out. Look at put the numbers up there, Micah. I'm going to look at that first real quick. But if you will not do so, and he's talking about not living up to what God has asked you to do, when you look at the whole context, you're on a context person. He said, if you don't do what God has asked you to do, behold, you have sinned against God. And be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. I pray this morning. 
that if you have something that you're trying to keep from God, you're not. And it's time to set it at the altar and give it over to Him. If you have wandered away, it's time to come home. It's time to humble yourself saying, God, I've made a mistake. I have called this thing. I've let this thing come into my life. It is set root. It's time to go. If you've never accepted Christ, if you've wandered away and you don't want to be in his pasture and you're like, I, I reject you, but you see today that without God you have no life, it's time to come home and let's accept Christ as our Savior so that all this sin can be taken away and forgiven as you stand before him in judgment one day. So let's all stand. We, we close in prayer. And it's up to you. It's not up to Ryan. It's not up to Brother Michael. It's not up to any deacon in this church. It's between you and God. It, it doesn't affect me. My relationship with God is my relationship. I, I stand in judgment of my sin, my things that I tried, my pride, my whatever it is. It's between me and him, and this is between you and him. But in the end, it, it will bring the cracks into your foundation if your foundation is not secure in Jesus Christ. Let's all bow for prayer. Lord, I pray this morning. For all the hearts in here and all the souls and all the minds, Lord, that if there is anything that they are trying to hide or keep hidden from you, Lord, then it will become to light this morning and laid at the foot. Lord, that they will say, God, I repent of the sin and I'll lay it down and I turn away from it and leave it on the cross. Lord, I pray right now if there's anyone in here that has not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, that today that they will say, Lord, I believe in you, I believe in Jesus Christ. And I want to be saved from myself and the sin that I have in me. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone in here that needs a home, that this is the home they need to come to to find encouragement, to come and find worship, that today will be the day that they come home to you. Lord, I thank you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll close in hymns. Let's sing together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So I pray that God has touched your heart and that God will work in your life if you'll just allow him to do so. Because God wants you to have a life and have it abundant. He, he's not here just to point out your flaws. He's here to guide and direct you to a life that he knows that has for you. It's just like any mom or father that wants the best for their children. He wants you 
to have a, a great life. It may not be one of fame and fortune that this world wants it to be, but one of peace and contentment that you have a father that loves you and has made you and that you are not a mistake in this world and that you have a purpose to give and to love and to share and to live his life for other people. So I hope this day, this week, that you can go and focus on him and turn to him all week and let him see what he's going to do in your life. So uh, with that, uh, Brother Jeff, will you close us in prayer? Amen. Well, first, Heavenly Father, we do thank you this day for your goodness, Father, for the opportunity to come here and worship and pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are, Lord, that we can turn to, that we can bring our, all of our, our shortcomings, our issues, our problems to you, Father. And we're just so thankful for that, Lord. And we just pray now that as we go our separate ways, Father, and God, that you would just keep us safe and watch over us, Lord, and, and just help us to be a shining light to others. We thank you, ask in thy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.